a lot of the people we work with on a daily basis are experienced athletes, they're weightlifters, powerlifters, or field athletes who've been training in the gym for a number of years. But who we're starting to hear more and more from now is the people who are a month, six months, or a year into training, and they want to start progressing a small bit faster. What we're going to do today is give you five tips that are going to make you progress as a beginner powerlifter or a beginner strength athlete. So tip number one, show them one fits. Tip number one is find a program, maybe even find a coach if at all possible, but find some kind of program, doesn't matter what it is, it's like 5x5, five five, strong lift, Texas methods, starting strength, T-Nation, T-Nation, do literally do Seekastrength.com. Well, they're good programs, so we know, we know they're good. <laughs> but any, any program at all, literally find one and stick with it, and stick with it for the duration of the program. If it's a program that has a start and an end, like a finish point. So get that program, diligently stick to it, stick to it as close as possible, complete all the reps and sets that they recommend that you do, do the assistance exercise recommended to do. If it's something like when there's 5-3-1, do it for minimum three to six months. Yeah. See how it feels. This is the biggest mistake that everybody makes. They get a program, they'll do it for two weeks or three weeks or five weeks and they think that's enough that's nowhere near enough like you need to give long periods of time like six months or a year is nothing in terms of training and it's nothing in terms of programming you have to stick with things for a long time to get like the necessary adaptations out of it i think to be honest if i was to be giving someone advice if you're like a young athlete or if you're just if your training age is low get a free program get something that loads of people have run before and just stick to it the the skill of sticking to a program and tracking everything as you're going through the program is so much more important than any kind of fancy well thought out programming is see one of the reasons that finding a program like any program at all works is because it'll also teach you what doesn't work so even if you get a bad program it will teach you a valuable lesson in what is too much volume too much intensity incorrect loading patterns or like wrong exercise selection or poor exercise selection it will teach all these things so when you do a poor program and then you see you don't make any progress you make very little progress uh god forbid you get injured or something like that but then you run another program you get some gains from that program then you're able to compare and contrast what good and bad programs may look like because and what what good and bad exercises and progressions are for you yeah yeah like it's all part of you figuring out what works for you um and like i cannot stress enough that you have to stick with things Mm -hmm. for prolonged periods of time and i get it like people are used to like what what everyone calls newbie gains but they're used to like really fast progression scales at the start and things slow down and they're chasing that dragon forever like realistically once you're a year or two in you need to be sticking to things for long periods of time um and giving away blocks of your season or blocks of your year to strength hypertrophy whatever it may be one of the other points as well is that now that we bring up newbie gains is that sometimes people can waste their newbie gains and make the least amount of gains they yeah. could have possibly made. So after a certain period of time, even if you don't force a load of adaption to like volume and intensity or whatever, you just do a lot of training for two or three years and you don't make a lot of progress, eventually your body will adapt to some level. And so these kind of newbie gains won't be as drastic as if you'd followed a diligent program that forced you to overload on different aspects of your training. So then you would have made, you want to get the most out of your newbie gains. And one of the best ways to do that is to follow a, a program, whatever it may be. Yeah. Okay. So the next tip, uh, like tip number two is gain muscle or don't be afraid of gaining muscle. Um, I think a lot of the times when you see people and they're in the gym, like a lot of people come into the gym and, and strength training for the body composition effects. And they come in to like look better, feel better, whatever that may be. If you want to make long-term progress in in strength sports, the gaining of muscle tissue is absolutely vital. And by no means do we mean, oh, you're a powerlifter now, so you're coming out of CrossFit or you're coming out of weightlifting or coming out of soccer and you're going to do a powerlifting. Don't get fat. Like, don't get the big, like, chunky, like, oh, it doesn't matter because it will help my squat. Probably will help your squat. But then you'll just be fat and have a big squat. So, like... Gaining muscle is important and being like allowing yourself to gain muscle is important, but also not allowing yourself to get fat is very important. 
Yeah, but the main one there is gain muscle. If, if anything, it'd be better if you gain some muscle and fat. Yeah. Rather than not gaining anything at all, like so don't hold yourself back, you know. So when you gain muscle, you need muscle for, especially in like a high force, uh, kind of low velocity sport that powerlifting is. So the more muscle you have, the more potential for strength you have. And the more, like the bigger the cross-sectional area of your muscle, like the more muscle you have, the more potential you have to be stronger as such. So you should definitely, aim, like Fitz is saying, not to get fat, but it should be a primary goal, like one of your couple of primary goals a year in your powerlifting career is to gain a modest amount of uh, lean mass every year. So even if that's something like like 0.5 kilos a year or something like that, which would be very admirable, like of lean mass a year, if you're a natural powerlifter and you're moving yeah. your, and you're like planning it for like 10 years down the line, like every year aiming for a little bit more muscle and like don't hold yourself back by cutting weight for competitions or trying to keep your wilks in a reasonable realm or something yeah, like that. Like, yeah, yeah. like really like muscle should be your priority because the more muscle you have, the more you can lift in, in the short term. And very, very, very importantly is you're setting yourself up for success in the long run as well. The more muscle you have, the sooner you have it. And the sooner you have it, the sooner you can learn to use it and recruit more, the higher torso units of that muscle, you know? Yeah. And I think it is like, it's a fallacy and it's something that a lot of people get caught up in is the, double or two and a half or triple like those body weight squats or deadlifts you know mm. and you see a lot of people and they like they're caught in the whirlpool of they want they're at like a 180 squat and they've been at a 180 squat for ages and they want to get to 190 for some reason mm -hmm. yet they're still 79 kilos you know or they're still 80 kilos and they're like the constant fighting of hypertrophy and atrophy and caloric deficits so they stay down low, you know, and, and never, ever get to, like, big numbers. Like, it really, really holds people back from long-term progression mm -hmm. uh, just because they have this number in their head. Like, uh, I know we obviously have similar feelings on this, but people getting the strength sports to lift heavy weights, and at the end of the day, your, your goals should reflect you lifting heavier weights progressively. Um, obviously, like, if you're going to cut down from 110 to an 85 kilo class or whatever the class may be and um, that's very very impressive but at the end of the day you want to be getting continuously stronger over time so don't be afraid of putting on some muscle now as a caveat for that if you do come into the sports and you're heavily overweight you know if you have yeah. a lot of excess fat um one of the the kind of the the goal prospects of being a newbie lifter is that you could gain muscle and lose fat for a period of time now, that would be kind of a difficult scenario if you didn't have someone who's um, an experienced nutritionist or whatever, an experienced yeah. coach as well. But as um, I would say, primary goal first would be to like adapt to lifts if you are overweight. So like just learn the lifts and then get comfortable and get a little bit stronger. And then you can slowly start trying to lose weight, you know, and then you can start looking at kind of what you do from there. But don't kind of come into powerlifting, try learn the lifts and try lose yeah. the weight and try gain muscle as well. Like, so just kind of, learn your sport first and then start trying to gain a little bit of weight and then deciding is it time for you to lose some fat or not yeah i think it's the thing of like if powerlifting is the sport you want to get into then you become a powerlifter first yeah and then you address body composition uh issues it's like the guitarist from leonard skinner used to say learn to play guitar first and then get sexy <laughs> joe like do one thing at a time and make sure the priorities are right so Tip number three plays into our tip number two as well, which is gain some muscle. So we're all about the tips. So tip number three, is do your accessories. So this is very, very important. So one of the main reasons you should be doing your accessories, right, is that so if you follow on from tip two, that you gain muscle as well. And these are one of the best ways to gain extra muscle as well. But when you do a lot of squat bench and deadlifts, you can't really accrue enough volume as they're too fatiguing. So if you if you listen to like um. Kind of, I suppose Mike Israel and Renaissance periodization kind of coined the term like stimulus to fatigue ratio, and if it, if they weren't the first ones, then apologies to whoever. Yeah, they weren't. Yeah, if whoever, but it it is a good concept. Like you know, it just kind of verbalizes a concept that everyone would understand intuitively. Like that, you can't just gain all your muscle from squat bench and deadlifting. Now, if you are a beginner powerlifter, you'll gain a lot of muscle from doing these initially, and then a bit of volume from these. But a kind of a low impact, kind of uh, low fatigue accessory exercises for you are very important to gain this muscle because. They won't fatigue your joints as much, your ligaments. Like if you're doing something like lateral pull downs or pull ups, these are all very, very important for gaining muscle and for, you know, like finding what works for you as well. Yeah. Uh, like the other thing with accessory movements and why they're particularly valuable for beginners is like 
in the beginner world, right? You're learning a movement, you're learning a strength movement, whatever the, whether it's squat bench or dead, deadlift or whether it's some other arbitrary lift you're learning. The loading, like obviously Gurf talked about volume and you can't get a lot of volume through the lifts, but when you're learning lifts and learning a motor pattern, you can't, like you can't drive intensity. And because of that, you can't really like continuously go after them in a big heavy way. So if you're trying to make somebody stronger and, and or like if you're trying to make yourself stronger, yet your deadlift is kind of crappy and you can't pull off the floor, then you doing RDLs and you doing leg presses and you doing all your other accessory work is going to be hugely beneficial while still keeping your deadlift weight low enough that you can make changes and make technical and like take on board technical cues and kinesthetic cues in a way that's meaningful without having to like really drive the weights on that deadlift um, and then probably not get your technical improvements. So the next point about using um, your accessory exercises to your advantage is, is you need to learn kind of what, what ones particularly suit you in terms of driving up your main lift. So again, if you are a competitive powerlifter, like your whole goal is always to drive your main lifts, your big tree. So doing a lot of uh, accessory exercises and practicing them and experimenting with them will help you kind of narrow down which ones are the most effective for you. So you might be kind of lifter who benefits from a lot of upper back work from their bench and you may find that like weighted pull-ups are the best exercise for you. Let's say you tried a load of different ones like dumbbell rows and you didn't really get much out of them. You tried barbell rows, all this. So the more you do, the more you figure out what works for you. So then as you get kind of later into your career and you kind of get like five years plus or more, 10 years, you start to have like an encyclopedia of what are the most effective exercises for you so you don't have to waste a lot of time when you're training you can go oh my back isn't big enough for my current bench goals because you're like you're looking for like a 180 bench or more and you'll know that you don't need to waste a lot of time then getting these new trying new accessory exercises and going for different ones you'll just know that i need to my push my upper back and i know my bench will go up along with that and then also the benefit of having doing those earlier in your career is that because you're doing all of these earlier in your career, like Fitz mentioned there, that you kind of get a lot of different newbie gains, like in terms of like my coordination, like you kind of, um, you'll still have the benefit of doing those early in your career. So you'll get all the benefits from those. But then when you're later in your career, you may not get as much benefit from trying so many ones because let's say your squat is very heavy or deadlifts are heavy. Yeah. So your fatigue management needs to be a lot more on point. So trying a lot of and, uh, different accessory exercises later won't be as productive as if you've done it sooner yeah like the thing on the accessory movements fixing things i think is really applicable as well because if look most of most of the people watching this don't have coaches you know or they have some interaction with coaches but not a huge amount yet a simple accessory movement doing that before or doing that after your main lift so say if they're squatting and their ass is shooting up they've super vertical shins they can't keep their knees out over their toes they can't keep as upright as you might want to be. Uh, them just doing some simple quad hypertrophy work for four or five weeks will help with that. And it's like they're easy fixes. The more they learn, like as Garf was saying, the more you learn, you just build up this book of knowledge, like all your training journals building together uh, will make you a hell of a lot more of an intuitive athlete. Um, I think the last thing on accessory work is you have to have some enjoyment in the gym. Um, and people going to the gym most of the time, you'll enjoy like lifting heavy weights. You'll enjoy getting a pump. You'll enjoy doing kind of enjoyable movements like uh, or like novel stimulus. So having some bit of a change, some bit of variety there um, and doing some like bodybuilding stuff is actually quite enjoyable. Uh, and it will give you a break from the monotony of squat, bench, deadlift, squat, bench, deadlift, squat, bench, deadlift. No gear. Hey. Like maybe uh okay so the next one the third one is no equipment and like when we mean equipment we mean knee sleeves knee wraps uh anything that supports your knees wrist wraps wrist wraps belt. elbow wraps belts uh squat shoes maybe are are grand yeah. um but still when you're teaching someone to squat they should still be flat footed so squat shoes are grand or weightlifting shoes are grand but in terms of wrist wraps knee wraps ankle supports fucking headbands mark bell slingshots don't use them when you're learning how to lift like you don't the whole point point of a lot of these is that they'll give you a bit of an extra advantage they'll give you some support when you really need support if you're benching 60 kilos you don't need wrist wraps um like unless you're benching like 150 160 plus you'll probably get away without wrist wraps and it really really limits your ability to adapt 
um, it also limits the stimulus you get from the exercises. So if I'm wearing knee sleeves, like we both wear uh, SPDs or have worn SPDs in the past, they help you. It's not, no matter what everybody tells you, it doesn't just keep your knees warm, you know. It gives you an advantage in the squat. Knee wraps obviously give you more of an advantage in the squat. Now, if you're squatting 300 kilos or if you're squatting big weights, you know, take that and you want to really, really push weights harder, take that by all means. But if you're, I, I don't want to name weights here now, like, and it's not about shaming people, but like, if you're squatting relatively light weights or you've only been training a few years, you don't need equipment, you don't need extra knee sleeves, uh, they will limit the training stimulus you get. <laughs> so one of the other reasons not using a piece of equipment is important is because it is kind of, it, it kind of holds back one of the pathways by which you get stronger when you're strength training. So there's a couple of different ones and like one of it, it's not only gaining more muscle. So gaining muscle obviously as we mentioned is important and there's a couple of reasons you do that. But another reason when you get stronger is you can only gain so much muscle, but then you also go through kind of a pathway known as like coordination. Now that doesn't mean like tying your shoelaces. Like that's your body's kind of intrinsic ability to perform that movement and increase its efficiency when it's performing that movement as you practice it. Okay. So when you are learning the lifts, you want to learn these kind of uh, crutch free as such. So you want to learn these without them. Okay. And there's kind of, it will inhibit your ability or not, not inhibit, but it will kind of, uh, alter your perception of these lifts so whenever you are doing them from now we don't want to throw it like functional fitness but the natural way that you might do them for you it might in inhibit your kind of your optimal technique or your optimal f form the way you would perform these movements later in your career so the sooner you learn them without the piece of equipment so like knee wraps or like wrist wraps or whatever you will kind of get some benefit from learning those lifts the most like efficient way you might do those so then when you do go on to use them and you, you do go on to use your knee sleeves maybe in a year's time or use a belt or whatever beyond that, it um it kind of it will give you more out of those. You'll get more out of those, so you'll get more bang for your buck from those. Yeah, like they definitely cover up your weaknesses. Um so like more knee support takes away from you having weak quads and like more wrist support allows you to have shit wrist positions overhead or shit wrist positions at a press. Um or like you, a lot of the time you'll see guys wrapping their wrists before they squat because they don't have mobility in their shoulders to support a bar in a low bar position on their back. So, yeah, so it's like a, a load limiting factor. So you kind of won't push your lifts, your absolute loads beyond your body's ability to withstand them. So when you're a newer lifter, especially in powerlifting, because the loads are higher, you're kind of under more potential to get injured as such so not using your wrist wraps or not using your belt won't allow you to kind of uh, run before you can walk as such so it'll give you it limits you a little bit but limit you in a benefit for a long way in, in like in the future like it'll benefit you that you kind of held your back yourself back a little bit now the last one then is train hard and don't be a bitch uh like we've talked about this a lot in the last few weeks but and especially with aaron kroll coming on the podcast we talked about a few years ago, it was very, very common for everybody to be overtraining, and that's not a good thing, right? No. Like, 10 years ago, or 13 years ago, when I started lifting weights, everybody who was training was constantly getting hurt all of the time. And, like, it was the same with you. Mm -hmm. Like, when we were in college, like, early days, everybody was always injured all the time because we trained a lot, way too heavy, and not intelligently is if anything now it's gone way back in the other direction and you have people who are auto-regulating before they realize what auto-regulation is uh you have people constantly mistaking muscular soreness and aches and pains and doms for injury um and then you have people who just like are constantly looking for an issue when there might be no issue there the key to getting good at at training and lifting weights is that you train hard you accrue a lot of volume. You do intensities, which will make you both physiologically and psychologically stronger. And that's about it. Like you try not to break the meat vehicle you drive around in, in the process of doing that. But at the end of the day, lifting heavy weights makes you way stronger. So like the only way you build to break your limits as such are, well, not the only way, but one of the more efficient ways to break your limits is by pushing yourself to those limits and knowing where they are. And so only by pushing yourself beyond those or as close as you can possibly get to those that you'll enhance your limits so you're like you push your limits to new limits as such so 
without knowing where they are if you don't train hard enough if you constantly train in the zone if you watched our previous video there on our pay-per-view on monday where you kind of training in a zone where you're not it's a little bit heavy and it's a little bit of volume but you're not really getting any benefits like in terms of like these were kind of biochemical markers but it, ultimately you just don't want to be training and not making any progress but getting fatigued and just kind of getting slightly worse all the time or worse still you just you're totally stagnated so you're consistently at the same weights for a year on year on end same amount of muscle mass or probably losing muscle mass getting a little bit of fatter like you don't like and people get loads of owies during that phase too you know yeah people get so many aches and pains and they're fucking sick of it and they're not making progress yeah like just training hard pushes you beyond all of that yeah uh and like it links back into the getting a program point it links back into not using equipment point it uses links back into accessory work like just having like if you're struggling with that kind of motivation side of things at the moment go and listen to the animal kid podcast and that will sort you out in 58 minutes uh if you're not sure about the level of volume you're doing like take a look at your program and see how many high rep sets you're doing unless you're in a peaking phase like do you have specific hypertrophy work in there do you have specific strength and power work in there uh I'm all for training intelligently and I'm all for auto regulation of loading. I'm all for uh, ranked and incremental increases over the course of a training block. I'm all for planning everything out. I'm all for getting people away from overtraining. Um, but at the end of the day, like you just have to work hard. You'll never, well, not never, but you'll almost certainly never regret training too hard. You'll never look back and be like, fuck, I pushed myself too. I trained too yeah. hard. And you'll never really regret it. You'll be like, that was kind of stupid. Maybe I did get injured because I trained too hard. But it'll teach you some valuable lessons. But like, you will never go, you will never ever look back and go, geez, I'm glad I didn't train that hard then. You'll never go. Yeah. You'll never think to yourself, like, I never, I'm glad I didn't push myself too hard there. I didn't push my limits too much. Like, for your, obviously there'll be times when you want to do that. But for your whole career, you like, you never want to be in that scenario. Absolutely, yeah. The last tip then is like a bonus tip. Um, and it's probably not for the beginner, beginner, but... For somebody who's getting into powerlifting and wants to compete in powerlifting, it's incredibly important you compete almost immediately and then compete frequently mm -hmm. forever. Or like until you're Forever. very, very good at going to competitions, completing the action and the task of doing a competition. Like the amount of people who put off their first competition until they can fucking squat, on, or squat 200 kilos um, and then they're a year and a half into training or two years into training and they're still haven't competed and then they do a huge training block and there's so much pressure and anxiety associated with competing like find a competition within your first few months of training go do it assess yourself afterwards do a training block find a new competition assess yourself afterwards yeah like and ignore ignore any arbitrary numbers that you might have on yourself that you need to hit this or whatever that like realistically It'll be so long before you'll hit any number that'll be make anyone of any notice take notice of you like that. So it's it's totally irrelevant. Like just ignore everyone else. Just go to the competition. Be very humble. Like don't don't expect like that someone's gonna be impressed by your one forty squat or whatever. And, and like that's not the rag on anyone obviously with a one forty squat. Yeah. But just come in, have your goals. You should definitely be being at your first few competitions. Like so, make sure just come in, have your goals. Be very very humble about them. Like quietly to yourself. No, that's your goal. Find someone that can help you if you if it's all possible. But um, from what we've seen, a part of the competitions there, they can be very well run if you find a good one. Yeah. So find a good competition and just get it as soon as possible, and then learn if you like it or not. And like the more you, the only way you'll ever get good at competing is by competing a lot. Like no one in strength sports was ever born with like the perfect skill to go yeah. to do your best every single competition. Like you have to learn that skill of competing just like you have to learn how to squat without shoes or, and deadlifts without a belt. Like it's 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 just another skill that you have to learn if you want to be a competitive powerlifter. Now obviously if you just like strength training then it's irrelevant too. Yeah and like the point you made there about don't have an arbitrary number in your head mm -hmm. is so important. Like you going doing a competition is for you. It's for you to get better at a skill. It's for you to understand your warm-ups it's for you to understand how long other people's warm-ups and attempts take it's for you to understand what reasonable jumps are in between each of your three lifts it's for you to understand how to like take on energy throughout the day how the stimulation will affect you like this is just another part of training and don't have it in your head do you have to have this squat this bench this deadlift um like i think i competed two and a half months into weightlifting 
Mm-hmm. Like I did a Cork Open. Five weeks, I think. Yeah. Like, yeah. it. just go and do it. Like, it's it's so much better. And with the like, younger athletes we've coached, when they've competed earlier, they are so much better at competing. And they're um, much more motivated as well to train, like much yeah. more disciplined because they understand what they're training for now rather than this kind of being a bigger thing in your head. Like, so the longer you put it off, like almost the more pressure you're putting in that competition for your first competition that you probably can't, like you, unless you're some absolute freak in nature, like isn't going to go that well for you. So, well, you'll, you'll probably hit your PBs, but you're not going to be smashing any world records if you're in any way a legitimate federation or national records, you know. So, yeah. like, don't make it a big thing in your head. Just do the competition. Just say to yourself, like, if, obviously right now is a different scenario, but if at all possible, do compete as soon as possible and then get it under your belt and then you'll be, you'll be, you'll, you won't regret doing it. And stop expecting to win. Yeah. Well, if you... Joe, so, like, you might be the strongest person at your gym, but, like, your first few competitions, that's not what you're looking for. A lot of the make you ones are kind of gone away now, aren't they? The comp- those federations. Yeah. I-D-F-F-P-A-Z-Z, like with 18 letters after them so if you are if you go back to point number one and you are looking for a program to run we have three once off programs on our website that you can run uh you can run all of them at least twice um we don't know if anyone's ran them more than twice at this stage no one's gone back to us but are that we know of um so we have a squat program road to anywhere squat program it's eight weeks two sessions a week we have our secret press so you can use that for standing press or bench press that's eight weeks two sessions a week as well and then we have seek a pull which is a deadlift program that's 10 weeks long two sessions a week um and these if you are looking for a program they're some of the best in the market we also have just our powerlifting blocks absolutely yeah um, so if you're looking to compete in power power li- powder lifting if you're looking to compete in powerlifting uh you'll get coaching you'll get programming you'll get weekly feedback on your videos um yeah that's it this is it now. <laughs>